if I were to um, talk to your neighbors and your uh, family members and people who know you best, people where you work, and ask them to describe you in one word, how many of you think that uh, the first word that would come to their mind would be the word joy? They'd say, when I think of uh, that person, that person is just full of joy. We just talked about that, uh, taking from Jesus the life and the rest and the joy. Jesus says he gives us his joy, that, that's his joy, and he gives it to his followers. Uh, Paul was a person who was characterized by joy, even though his life was incredibly difficult. Uh, when God first called him to minister for Jesus Christ and to take the word of Christ to the Gentiles, he said, I will show you how much you must suffer for me. And his life was full of suffering. There were, there were groups of people that would follow him around trying to kill him and trying to disrupt everything he did. At one point, he lists all the times that he was beaten and stoned and thrown into prison. And yet, his life was characterized by joy. So when people think about you, when people know, who know you, would they say about, about your life, well, you know, they, they have their difficulties in life. They've had struggles. They've had hardships. But they are a person who is full of joy. I'd like you to think about that because I think we should be as Christians. But I don't know a whole lot of Christians where uh, that comes across as much as it should. Paul did. Paul uh, joy is one of the recurring themes in his life, and we've been studying his life, and we're going to look at a section today in his life when he, when he suffers and when he is joyful in the midst of suffering. I want to tell you about another missionary, though, who was a, a great example of this. His name was Benjamin Weir, and he had been uh, held as a hostage in Lebanon for 16 months. We're hearing a lot about uh, kidnappings and hostages today. It's in the news all the time. And it's been going on for a while. Christians have been kidnapped, and we prayed today for Pastor Saeed, who's lived in miserable conditions for longer than this. But Benjamin Weir had been in this uh, prison, a, a miserable prison in Lebanon for 16 months. And when he was released and came back to the States, he was uh, surrounded by reporters who wanted to find out uh, about his conditions and, and what he went through. And they said to him, how did you spend these long days, 16 months, that's a lot of days, a lot of hours, how did you spend your time, what, was, what, what were you doing in that time? And he said, most of the time I spent counting my blessings. And the reporters just were sort of stunned, they, they, it was the last thing they expected him to say. While you were in prison, in these miserable conditions, you spent your time counting your blessings. He said, what do, you, what do you mean? And he said, oh, there were some days when I got to take a shower, and I would just praise God for that. And there were some days when there would be vegetables in my food, and I could praise God for that. And he said, every single day I could praise God because I, have a, I had a family back home that loved me and was praying for me, and I would just count my blessings all day long. Boy, that kind of makes you think, uh, how would you deal with that situation, if you were unjustly thrown into these miserable conditions, would you be the one counting your blessings or would you be tending to kind of grumble and complain about how unfair life is? But Paul was one of these people who could praise God in the midst of the most difficult things. You know, later on, Paul would write, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. The key word there is always. Because we all rejoice in the Lord sometimes, and if he had said rejoice in the Lord sometimes, we would say, I do that. But he didn't. He said rejoice in the Lord always. And that's a whole, that's a whole different thing. Because there are times when, when we're pretty miserable, and when our circumstances are not what we want, and when we're, when we're very angry and upset and... and he says, rejoice in the Lord always. And now it's one thing to say that. In fact, it's one of those things that's easy to say. But what's more impressive about Paul is that he actually did this. He didn't say it without, without putting it into practice. He put his own words into practice. He, he walked the talk, as they said. And we're going to take a look today at a time when he rejoiced in the Lord when you would have thought it would have been impossible in those circumstances. It's found in Acts chapter 16. 
And we're going to start in verse 16 when Paul and his buddy Silas get thrown into prison. He said, once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. Well, what's going on right here in this circumstance is there was a group of men who were exploiting uh, this demon-possessed slave girl who was given by apparently the demonic forces inside of her was given an ability to predict the future. And people in those days, as people do today, would pay a lot of money to know what was going to happen in the future. There are people who go to fortune tellers all the time and look for anybody who can give them you know, some hope or some idea of what's going to happen to them in the future. And let's be honest, if you knew that there was somebody let's say right here in this church, who could accurately tell you what's going to happen, a lot of us would want to know. Some of us don't, but a lot of us would want to know. We might even pay money for that information. And that's what was happening. So these guys had a great business going. And then they run into Paul. So look in 17. It's this girl, this demon-possessed girl, said she followed Paul and the rest of us. Remember, Luke is writing with them right now, so he's telling this in the first person here. Um, she followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. That's what she was shouting. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed. Okay, Paul did get annoyed sometimes. It says it right here. He became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the Spirit, not to the girl, but he said to the Spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the Spirit left her. That's powerful stuff, isn't it? This is showing the authority of Jesus Christ over a demon. Now, let's talk about why he did this. The girl was following them for days. And he, she kept shouting this. She shouted, these men are the servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. Well... That doesn't seem so bad, does it? I mean, everything she said is true. She's not saying, uh, these men are from the devil or these men are trying to make money off of you. She's not telling any lies. These men are from the Most High God telling you how to be saved. The problem was she didn't stop shouting that for days. She shouted that over and over again for days. It's sort of like a little kid when he says, Mom, 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 Mom. After a while, it's like, what? She's been shouting this for days. And it's hard for Paul and Silas and Luke to carry on conversations with people and to talk to them about Jesus Christ and to hear about their lives and, and to pray with them and have study the Bible. When this lady is shouting constantly, these men are from the Most High God telling you how to be saved, and just over and over again. So Paul becomes so annoyed that he puts a stop to it. And he knows that the power of Jesus Christ is greater than the power that's in that girl. And he speaks to that spirit in the name of Jesus. And the name of Jesus is so powerful that the spirit immediately leaves the girl. That seems good, right? Well, it's going to cause problems. So let's see what happens here. Um, in verse 19, when the owners realized that their hope of making money was gone... Now, notice what it, do, what it doesn't say. It doesn't say, when they noticed that this poor girl was freed from the demon, oh, they were so happy for her. Not at all. They didn't care about her. They saw her as a cash cow. She was someone who was going to make money for them. So it says, when they, saw, when they realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. Okay, let's, let's look at that for a minute. You see, Rome, when they conquered countries like Israel, they allowed these countries to continue to practice their religion. It, the Roman strategy was brilliant, to be honest with you. They, they gave self-rule. They allowed the people to govern themselves uh, to some extent, and they allowed them to worship, to, to keep their own religion. 
So the Jews were allowed to continue their own faith, and, and every, pl- every place they went, was, they were allowed to practice their own religion. But there was one exception. There was one rule, and that was that you were not allowed to proselytize. That means to, you were not allowed to try to convert these Romans to your religion because in every country there would be Roman magistrates and guards and, and people that were there. And so you could worship your own religion, just keep it to yourself, and don't try to convert the Romans to your religion. That was against the Roman law. And that's what these men were appealing to when they went to the magistrates and they said they're advocating customs that are unlawful for us Romans to accept and to practice. And so they were saying that these men have broken the law. They're only angry because they've lost money. They could care less what Paul and Silas are teaching, but they're so angry at them for for ruining their business that they've decided that they're going to get even with them. So let's look what happens in, in, in verse 22. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates. Uh, the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. Um, let me just take a second about beating with rods. Uh, what they did in those days was they, they took, the rods were bundled together. It, it wasn't just one stick, like a cane, hitting somebody with a cane. They were, there was a, a group of sticks there, a number of sticks, and they were, they were bound together with leather strips. And when they would beat a person with, that, with those rods, it would be incredibly painful. It, these, the men would be stretched over uh, a, a, like a stone and, and tied into place. So their back would be stretched and exposed. And when that rod would come down upon them, it would bruise them. It would cause them to bleed under the surface. It would also probably break a few ribs, and it would cause the skin to just split open as well. And it says here that they were stripped and beaten with rods. And look at the next verse. After they had been severely flogged, this was not a mild beating at all. These men were severely beaten. After that, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. But it gets worse. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell, and he fastened their feet into stocks. Now, fastening their feet into stocks, that was not for security purposes, because they were already put into an inner cell that was locked, and there was no way they could get out. When they put their, these prisoners' feet into stocks, it was to make their misery worse. Can you imagine trying to get comfortable after you have been beaten like that, and your back is opened up, and you have broken ribs, and you're bruised and bleeding? Can you imagine how hard it would be to just find some position where you could sit down or lie down or stand or somewhere where you could be comfortable and not just be in excruciating pain. That would be hard enough. But how much more difficult would be would it be if you're put on this hard bench and your feet are put into stocks and now you can't move at all? I would think that it just increases their suffering and their pain a hundred times. Well, here's the amazing part. Verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. They were singing hymns to God. Again, we must put ourselves in their place and say, what would you be doing after you were severely beaten and now put your feet in stocks? I think the, the closest to singing I would be doing was be loud groaning, um, but I can't imagine at that point in all of that pain singing hymns to God, but that's what they were doing. And when it says, almost as an afterthought, and the other prisoners were listening to them, you better believe that the other prisoners took notice because this was not something you would ever hear in a prison. You would hear all kinds of swearing and cursing and screaming and crying, but you didn't hear people singing praises to God in, that, in a prison like this. And so every prisoner in there took notice what was going on. And it was about midnight, it says. About midnight, these two decided, let's have a worship service. And they start worshiping God at midnight, singing these hymns. 
This was a joy that was inside of Paul and Silas, given to them by Jesus Christ, that was completely independent of the circumstances. That's the difference between happiness and joy. Happiness depends upon your happenings, your circumstances. So you're happy when things are going good, and you're unhappy when things are going bad. Joy is independent of the circumstances. And you can have the joy of Jesus Christ when things are going great and when things are going terribly And that's what Paul and Silas did. They were expressing the joy of Jesus Christ in the lowest, deepest, worst possible moment in their lives. And then the action continues in verse 26. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and then he saw the prison doors when he saw the prison doors open he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped but paul shouted don't harm yourself we are here the jailer called for lights rushed in and fell trembling before paul and silas he brought them out and asked sirs what must i do to be saved isn't this amazing the earthquake takes place The doors are open. The chains fall off. We sang a song today about that, didn't we? Amazing grace. Our chains are gone. They fall off, and God sets us free. And God has just set those prisoners free, but they don't move. When that took place, this prison is pitch black. You know, the only way this thing could be lit was through torches. And, of course, at night, all the torches are out, and nobody can, like, flip a light switch and all of a sudden see what's going on. So when the jailer feels this earthquake and wakes up and realizes that the doors are open, and he, his first assumption is, well, any, all the prisoners must have run for their lives, and that means he's going to be killed because it's his responsibility. Remember earlier it said the jailer had been told to watch him carefully. These were special prisoners. And in those days... If he failed in his responsibility, he would suffer the punishment they were meant to suffer. And he knew he was going to be killed. So without even asking any questions, he grabs a sword and he's ready to kill himself. And Paul intervenes and says, wait, wait, wait. By the way, I don't know how Paul knew that because it was pitch black. But Paul stopped him before he could do this. And he said, we're all here. Can you imagine the shock of that guard? I, I mean, he, I, I would wonder he'd say, why? What are you doing here? Why aren't you long gone? But I mean, I'm glad you're here, but Paul says, we're all here. And, and once the jailer lit some torches and could see that it was true, he doesn't ask a lot of questions about all of these things. Maybe he was there and listened to Paul singing those hymns that night before. And he runs to Paul and he falls on his knees and he said, sirs, What must I do to be saved? What an amazing question to ask. How would you answer that question if you're Paul? The man falls before you. Maybe someday in your lifetime, somebody in your family or one of your neighbors or somebody at work or at school will come up to you and say, you know, I I know that you're a Christian, and I want to be a Christian, so what must I do to be saved? Do you have an answer ready for that if somebody asks you that question? You should always have an answer ready for that. Be prepared. Uh, Timothy says, in season and out of season. It means when you're ready and when you're not ready. Be prepared to give an answer for the hope that you have. And Paul was ready to give an answer. This is Paul's answer. He says in verse 31, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Paul doesn't give a sermon, which is kind of surprising knowing Paul. <laughs> he, you would have thought he would have given a sermon with three points and a poem and collected an offering and didn't, you know, we got the crowd together, let's, let's have. But no, he gives one sentence, a preacher answering a question in one sentence. That's a miracle of God right here in verse 31. <laughs> Believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved, you and your household. That's his whole answer. He's talking about it's, it's a matter of faith. You need to put your faith in Jesus Christ. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. 
And then he spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in the house. So he did explain it a little further. He spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in this house, all the other prisoners who had been listening too. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Boy, that must have felt good. That must have been such a blessing to these men who had been beaten so severely to have their wounds washed. He says that... um, He took them and washed their wounds, and then immediately he and all of his household were baptized. The jailer and his household were baptized. Immediately they were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. So he's not only washed their wounds, but he's going to feed them. And says he was filled with joy. Here's a transfer of joy, by the way. Earlier at midnight, Paul is full of joy, and he's singing these songs. After the earthquake, the jailer is in total and utter despair, ready to take his life. And now, a short time later, because he's received Christ, it says he he was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. So Paul gave him a short answer, and then he gave him an explanation. He said, the answer lies in faith. You notice the question said, what must I do? To be saved. That's what everybody will ask because they believe that they have to somehow do something to earn God's favor. Uh, it's, you know, it's not, it, it can't be free, so I have to work for this. What must I do? But Christ has already done everything that needs to be done. He is the one who died in our place. He's the one who rose from the dead and defeated Satan and defeated sin. And he has is, he is done all the work. So what is left for us is to believe in Jesus Christ, to put all of our faith in Jesus Christ, not to do anything, but to put our faith into Christ and, and to believe in him. So Paul's answer was perfect. I want you to go back to the beginning when we said Paul is rejoicing in prison. Why is Paul rejoicing in prison when he's in such pain, when he's been beaten so severely? Why in the world would he be rejoicing in prison? Well, I think we see now why he was rejoicing in prison. Because Paul had this assurance from Jesus Christ when Christ called him at the beginning of his ministry that Jesus was going to go with him that wherever you are, I will be with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And when Paul was in that prison, bleeding and broken and in great pain, he knew that Jesus Christ was with him. And he was rejoicing because he knew that wherever he was, God could use him to touch the lives of other people. And in the darkest prison, with his feet in stocks, He's praising God, and sure enough, at that moment, God uses him to touch the lives of the prisoners and the prison guard. And the prison guard came to Christ and all of his family. And I wonder how many of those other prisoners came to, came to Christ as well, because they, the, they witnessed the singing, they witnessed the powerful miracle with the earthquake, and they witnessed the explanation of Paul of how you can come to know Jesus Christ. And at least for the jailer, he made, a, he made a decision that day. He made a decision to pray and to invite Jesus Christ into his life. You know, your, your relationship with Christ needs a starting point. Every relationship you have has a starting point. There was a time when you first met every person that you know. It had a starting point. You met them and you said, hi, my name is Tom. What's your name? And you exchange your name and you exchange information. And then your relationship grows from that point. Every relationship has a starting point. Your relationship with Jesus Christ needs a starting point, and that starting point is the day that you finally realize that you are a sinner and you cannot get rid of your sin. And you need a Savior who will take care of that, and Jesus Christ is the one who has already paid for your sin. And the starting point is when you say, Lord Jesus, I believe in you. Forgive my sin. Come into my life, Lord Jesus, and be my Savior, be my Master. And that's the starting point. Some people make the mistake of thinking that, you know, if I just go to church every day, eventually I become a Christian. You know, the old joke is it's like thinking that if you sit in a garage every day, you'll become a car. There there has to be a big decision, a beginning point when you receive Jesus Christ. So what I'd ask you is to think back in your life, when did you make that decision? Did you make that decision? 
It might be that some of you have kind of made that mistake of thinking that somewhere along the line you just gradually became a Christian. But you, Jesus describes it like this. He said, I stand at the door and I knock. And if any man hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in. Well, here's the, here's the part, here's your responsibility, to open the door. He never comes into a house unless the person invites him in. And so the question is, have you ever invited Jesus Christ to come in? If you're not sure about this, my recommendation is do that today. If you're not sure, if you don't remember a time you ever invited him in, just pray that simple prayer. Lord Jesus, have mercy upon me, a sinner. Forgive my sins. Come into my life, Lord Jesus. Be my Savior and be my Master. Be the Lord of my life. Amen. That simple prayer. Pray that prayer. The jailer prayed that prayer. And he and his whole household were saved. They were immediately baptized. Their lives were changed. When people see Christians behaving in a way that is inexplicable, it makes them take notice. You know, back in the 1970s, there was a a cruel dictator in Uganda named Idi Amin. And he killed a number of Christians. And in 1973... Uh, he sentenced these three men to death. The, these three men were in, the, in the, the territory, the diocese of a bishop named Bishop Fiesto Kivangeri. I'm sure I pronounced it wrong, but that's my pronunciation of it. Bishop Festo Kivangeri. Uh, bis- this Bishop Kivangeri came over to the States years later, and I, and I saw him speak, and he told the most amazing stories. And he told about this day in 1973, on February 10th, where... Idi Amin not only sentenced these three men to be shot with a firing squad, but he ordered that everybody in this town would come to the local stadium and witness it because he wanted them to see what would happen to Christians if you dared to cross Idi Amin. And so 3,000 people came into the stadium, and they were sitting all around the floor of the stadium. And the firing squad was set up on the, on the floor of the stadium, and these three men were brought in chained on, by their hands and their feet. They came in with, stepping as, as much as they could, walking in there with the chains rattling as they walked in. And this Bishop Festo Kevin Jerry, as he told the story, he said that he had been given permission by EDMN to go talk to these men before they were shot because, after all, they were in part of his diocese and he was in charge of that group. So they were on the floor standing in front of the firing squad and Bishop Festo Kiv and Jerry comes up from behind them to talk to them before they get shot. And he said these three men heard him coming and they turned around and they said, Bishop, Bishop, we're so glad to see you. And he said their faces were, were full of joy. And one of the men said to him, Bishop, he said, the night that I was re- arrested, the night that I was arrested, I invited Jesus Christ to come into my heart. And he forgave all of my sin. And he made me a new person. And he removed the barrier between me and God. And now there is nothing between me and God. And now I'm going to go to get to be with Jesus. And he said, he said, tell my family, tell my wife and my children to accept Jesus. And we will all be together in heaven. And he said these men were, were all saying the same thing. The other two men said the same thing. They had accepted Jesus and they were, they were forgiven of their sins and they were ready to go be with the Lord. And he said they were waving their hands and shaking and they were full of joy. And he said people in the crowd were waving to them and they were waving to these men and the people in the crowd with their beaming faces of joy as they were waiting to go home to be with the Lord. And the bishop said, I, I felt at that moment that it wasn't these men who needed me to speak to them so much as the soldiers who were holding the guns. They were the ones who needed my, my counsel more than these men. These men were, were at peace and they were full of joy. And so while he was there, he spoke to the soldiers holding the guns and said, look at these men. They have received Jesus Christ. You should do the same thing. Look at them. They're ready to die. And, and he, he witnessed to the soldiers on the floor of the stadium. And then it, his time was up, and he was, he was escorted away. And the three men waved their arms. And the people of the crowd shouted back to them. And they, shout, they, they were praising God. 
to the people, and the people were praising God back to them. And then suddenly the shots rang out, and these men went to be with Jesus. But Bishop Festo Kevin Jerry said that afterwards, after that took place, he said hundreds of people came to know Jesus because they saw the way these men died, and they knew it was real. That's what happened in the prison. That's why the jailer came to know Jesus, because he saw Paul and Silas full of joy at a time when no, there was no human explanation for that kind of joy. The only thing you could explain was the joy of Jesus Christ. And he knew it was real, and he received Christ. So if you've never received Christ, do that today. Be like those men, have that, have that peace of mind that knows that no matter what happens, there's nothing between you and God, and you're ready to be with him whenever God calls you home. And for those who have received Christ, follow this example of Paul and just allow the joy of Jesus Christ to radiate through you no matter what your circumstances. And who knows, God might use you the way he used those men in the stadium and the way he used Paul in the jail. He might use you so that others will look at you and know that Jesus Christ is real and come to know Jesus Christ. Wouldn't that be excellent? Let's pray together. Almighty God, we, we give you praise today for the joy that Jesus Christ gives, a joy that the world does not have and it cannot be bought, but it's a joy that runs throughout every day of our lives, no matter what the circumstances. Lord, I pray that you will fill every person here with the joy of Jesus Christ. And that it'll, be, it'll radiate from them when they go home and when they go to work, when they go to school. Their neighbors will see that joy. And that someday if they're asked what, how to describe that person in one word, they would say joy. Lord, help them, help them to look at us and see Jesus. To know that that joy is the joy of Jesus Christ. And use us, Lord, as a light that will lead other people to give their lives to Jesus Christ. It is in his beautiful name that we pray. Amen.